Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is that gospel lesson that I read from Mark chapter 13. Let me just read one one verse from that text again. Jesus says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. This is the word of our Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, for the next four weeks here at Redeemer, throughout all the month of December, we're going to be talking about gifts. As we heard in the children's sermon, we we know a thing or two about anticipating gifts. I kind of watched, it's mostly adults here this morning, and as I was talking to the children, I, I noticed most of you were following right along. We anticipate gifts. Right, we, we watch under the Christmas tree just as much as they do, and, and, and we wait eagerly in anticipation for the Christmas letters and the Christmas cards that, that fill us in on our loved ones. When our birthdays come around, right, don't we wait to see who's going to be the first one to call us to wish us a happy birthday or the first one to, to give us a gift for our special day? No matter how young or old you are, we all know what it's like to wait and watch for gifts. At its heart, this season of Advent that, that we're now in is a season of preparation, of, of waiting, watching. As I said before the service, the word Advent, advenio, is a Latin word that means to come or, or to arrive. In Advent, we're preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ. And that means Advent has always had a dual, even a a triple theme. When we think of Christ's coming at this time of the year, of course, we have Christmas on our minds. When Jesus came in humility, a baby in a manger, to fulfill God's promise to Adam and Abraham and the patriarchs. We also recognize in the season of Advent how Jesus comes to us through his word again and again speaking to us, the Holy Spirit filling our hearts with faith, strengthening us to endure in this world. But in the season of Advent, as we think of Christ's coming, it's not just Christmas and it's not just the word. We also have in mind that second coming of our Lord. The, the one we've been talking about for a few weeks during the end of the last church year in the season of end times, as we wait and we watch for Jesus at Christmas, it's perfectly natural to think about how we wait and we watch for Jesus to come in glory. As you heard the t- sermon text I read earlier, I'm guessing it's fairly easy to identify which of the advents of Jesus this text is talking about. That second coming, not the baby, but the king. As we watch for gifts from God this Advent, we we prepare for Christ's coming with open eyes. We know our need for salvation, and we know that's exactly what we, we receive when our Savior comes. The words to our text here, they were spoken during Holy Week. Right, the, the week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, he had, Jesus had been, been preaching and teaching in the temple courtyards, and, and, and as they were leaving, one of the disciples looks at the temple all around them and says to Jesus, it's the verse 1 in chapter 13, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And the temple was magnificent. The, the temple that Jesus had been teaching in or, or near the temple that the disciples were looking at around them was the, Herod that, the, the temple that Herod had built. And it was a sight to behold. It had taken 46 years to build up to that point. And it would be another 30 years before it would be completed in, in 64 AD. The, the stones that the, that the Jews used to build the temple, they were reportedly 37 feet long, 12 feet high and 18 feet wide. I, I, looked, I looked up this week, try to find what that's like. Picture a semi-trailer. A little bit shorter than a semi-trailer, but close. And now double it in width and make it completely out of stone. And imagine constructing that without cranes or power equipment. Herod's Temple? 
maybe it, maybe it didn't rival Solomon's temple in grandeur and, and, and display, but, but Herod's temple was magnificent, impressive nonetheless. The disciples, look, isn't this amazing? Jesus? Jesus isn't as impressed as they were. He says to them in, in, in verse 2 at the beginning of this chapter, Do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And of course, Jesus was right. It does, this temple that took 76 years to build, to complete, would stand finished for just six. In 70 AD, it would be totally destroyed by the Romans. It would never be rebuilt. In fact, you can go to Jerusalem today and find just a piece of a wall left. And that prophecy is so shocking to the disciples that, that some of them come back later. And that's where we get to our text all the way down in, in verse 32. They ask Jesus when this destruction on the temple is going to happen. And again, Jesus isn't impressed. He doesn't give them an answer. He said they wouldn't know when it would happen, but that they should be ready whenever it did. And then he turns this conversation about the temple in Jerusalem into something greater. And that's where our text picks it up. In verse 32, it says, No one knows about that day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. Go to any Christian bookstore, or chances are turn on your TV and, and watch, a, watch a televangelist preach on Sunday morning, and you'll hear people offering their ideas of a timetable for the end of the world. Remember Harold Camping a few years ago? Predicted the end of the world twice in a six-month span and was obviously wrong both times. What does Jesus think about all of these predictions of the end? Well, don't believe them, he says. Even Jesus, in, in one of the great mysteries of the Trinity, even Jesus humbly submits to the Father and, and leaves it in his hands alone. Jesus says even the Son doesn't know when this is going to happen. But Jesus does give us two words of warning in this verse. When he says, be on your guard, in, in Greek that's just one word. And, and that word has the idea of looking closely at something. The, the way you would look when you're crossing a busy street. right? You, you look left, and then you look right before you even step off the curb. And then as you're crossing, the whole way you're looking back and forth, back and forth, so that you're ready to jump out of the way of some irresponsible, inattentive driver on their cell phone is going to mow you down. Jesus also says, be alert. And in Greek, that's one word too again. That word has the idea of chasing away sleep. Right? It's what you do when you're feeling drowsy on a long road trip. Right? You, you roll the window down even if it's freezing outside. You, you chew on some sunflower seeds. You crank up the radio. You pinch yourself. Any, anything to keep yourself awake so you don't fall asleep while you're driving down the road. Those are the words Jesus tells us, or Jesus uses to tell us about the last day. We all know to do that in this life. We, have, we all know to look carefully before we cross a busy street. We all know to, to do whatever we can to chase away sleep while we're driving. But are we so vigilant when it comes to Jesus and his coming, his advent? Being on guard, being alert means paying attention to God and, and specifically listening to him when he speaks in his word. It means regularly letting God point out my sin and continually being reminded of my forgiveness from that sin in Jesus. So how often should we hear God speak? Well, I sin every day. And so every day I want, I need to hear God tell me that that's washed away by the blood of the Lamb. We fall down in front of God every week in failure. And so every week we gather together again here in worship to hear those wonderful truths about Jesus and his love for us. Let's get back to reading God's word at home. 
Let's get back to to hearing the word here at church. Let, let's look at this gift with so much purpo- with the same amount of purpose and eagerness as our kids hunt around the house looking for the hidden Christmas presents that they know are there somewhere. We know the promises of God and where they are. Staying alert for Jesus' return, though, doesn't just mean sitting and hearing his word. Jesus also wants us to be busy doing his work, and that's what the parable Jesus teaches here is really about. Jesus says, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. And then at the end of the parable, if he comes suddenly, the master, do not let him find you sleeping. Be on guard. Be alert. Who runs the church? not me it's not the church council you do jesus has has given each one of us the responsibility to do some specific part of his work until he returns he's left each of us with some specific thing to do that he doesn't give to anybody else so what work are you doing what what work or responsibility in the church has the lord entrusted and assigned to you Maybe you've never thought about it. Or maybe you have thought about it and you've decided you're just going to to wait to take care of that at a later time. (laughs) No, Jesus says. Get to work on it now. If if Jesus finds you sleeping when, when you return, or when he returns, sitting, even in a pew, but sitting nonetheless, well, it might show him that the faith you claim made it to your mouth, but not your heart. As James says in his letter, faith without works is dead. So I ask again, what work of the Lord are you doing? What activities are we talking about? Some of these things are indeed part of the work we do here as a church. We, we, have, some, we, we have needs for some of the most important and simple roles in our church. Greeters that make people feel welcomed and invited when they come into our church. Ushers, men and women that that simply make our church services go a little smoother. The visuals up on our screens that we use every single week that every one of our members looks at, did you know that's only done by two people in our church? In a month, it's going to be just one person in our church? That's just for worship. We, we need to hear ideas for ministry from our members. Ways that we can encourage and and share it with each other and build each other up. That comes from you. We could do so much more for people in our community to help them out in difficult times. We could reach out to so many more lost souls. But the tasks that God gives us to do, the assignments that he left to accomplish until he returns, they're not just carried out as part of our church membership. God calls us to be faithful in whatever we do as students and parents, as children and co-workers and friends? Do your choices in life lead others to, to want the faith you have or question your sincerity in it? Is the example you set for your children the example that God would want you to give to them? Advent is the perfect time to open our eyes. Not only to his coming, but, but to how we're living and what we're doing as we wait for it, as we prepare for it. So use this month, use this week, use this day, this service, this, this sermon to examine how you use the time that God gives you. To, to look at how you spend whatever money God has given to you to consider how you take care of your body and and, and how you use the talents that God has blessed you with. And as you hold that mirror up to yourself and inevitably find yourself lacking, like we all do, well then turn your eyes to Christ's advent once again and see the gift of your salvation with clear and open eyes. Open your eyes to recognize that that baby in the manger isn't just some culture or neat tradition or or wonderful, heartwarming, fuzzy picture, but that there is the key to your forgiveness. Open your eyes and and see the cross as the greatest treasure you have, greater treasure than, than money or family 
or time itself, that their salvation is granted. Their eternal peace is presented to you. Open your eyes to the promises that God will come back to judge the world on the basis of faith, not on works, on the merits of Christ, not on you. And with eyes wide open in faith, well, then God will renew our hearts to serve him in love. That's what Advent is about. Don't let the master find you sleeping when he returns. Instead, open your eyes to the tasks, tasks God has appointed to you, either at home or at work or, yes, here in church, in this church's ministry. Be prepared, watchful and alert. The gift of salvation has already come, and the giver of salvation promises to return in glory. Brothers and sisters, may we always be ready, in joy, living with thanksgiving. Amen.